for that welcome. Like Dr. Pierce said, um, I'm Becky Hayes from the Illinois State University and this is Caleb Carr. Today we're talking about something we've termed paralinguistic digital affordances. A really big mouthful of a phrase that is likes and shares and upvotes across social media, across social media platforms. And paralinguistic digital affordances, the big mouthful of a phrase, kind of intended um, because we wanted to be able to make the acronym PDA. So PDAs on social media. So this presentation is going to cover a couple of topics and we hope you'll like the presentation, but will you like it? <laughs> Cheesy line, yep. And for those of you tweeting along, feel free to like it. Like it. <laughs> so what we're talking about today, first, well, Katie's right, we are going to be talking about um, the studies that frame paralinguistic digital affordances and look at some of their uses and interpretation across social media platforms. We're first going to contextualize what we're talking about today within social media. We have a piece from last year where um, we actually defined social media in a way um, that helps give some some frame, some framework to what we'll be talking about with PDA. So we're going to talk about that first, and then we're going to move into what we phrase and what you might hear us use accidentally as the liking studies. Right now it's a series of three or four um, pieces in various stages of published r and and in press and at ICA, um, but sometimes we casually refer to them as the liking papers. But that's what we're going to be doing second. First, Caleb, though, is going to be talking about how we communicate. Sure. Um, so in order to sort of help set this up, we want to do a brief run through on how we, how we communicate, particularly online, because that's where these PDAs are occurring. So when we're offline, we've often thought of offline as being this really channel-rich environment. We have lots of ways to get messages and meanings between sender and receiver. So we look at things like our clothing, and our clothing certainly makes a communicative message, like my car pulls towards Starbucks for PSL season. Certainly our actions communicate as well. I didn't, I didn't want to have that conversation. It was boring anyway. And of course our words have meaning. Offline, we have all these tools available, available to us. For a long time we thought online we were more limited. Online we thought we were really constrained down to just text. But we see that changing. And we later found out this wasn't quite right anyway, but more, more important to us today. We see this changing, that we're no longer constrained to just text online. Particularly through social media, we see the same social, we see each social medium, each tool, giving us a lot of different channels through which we can communicate, all within the same medium. So we can post a message, we can send a link, we can have audio video content, we can sometimes have real-time chat communication. So there's all these interesting ways we can start exploring through media how we communicate. But that sort of gives us opportunities to ask both new questions about how we communicate and then sometimes re-explore old questions in very specific contexts or using the medium to our advantage. One of the things that we wanted to look at were, first of all, what are social media? Now there have been some definitions about what, just trying to define social media since the early 2000s. The problem we had when we started going through them and people were sort of talking about social media very nebulously where there was always some fault or limitation or constraints to definitions we saw. Some of them were very constrained in a certain technology and basically said, well, social media are things like Facebook, which is great, but as definition goes, suck, because once you forget what Facebook is, you, you know, there's no reference point, it doesn't mean anything. Or they were defined by certain tools, or they were defined in the social media of today. So we always had these limitations. So we came up with uh, their internet-based, disentrained, and persistent channels of mass personal communication, facilitating perceptions of interactions among users, Driving, primary, uh, uh, driving value primarily from user-generated content. Who has had Dr. Pierce's grad class? You have seen this definition before, Despa? Undergrads too. Undergr How many have had Dr. Pierce's undergrad class? You guys, okay, you guys have seen this definition before, right? Yeah. Remember when you went through some of these words and went, what the hell is he talking about, right? Let's see if we can unpack that. So the first thing we came up with, uh, we wanted to make sure we understood these things are internet-based and we pointed this out basically to differentiate it from the World Wide Web. 
oftentimes when we go online, we think about, well, I'm on the web, I'm online, I'm on the internet. And we get these terms kind of blurry. But we see a lot of tools that we use for communication these days that rely on the internet, but not on the web. And the web is just an application that runs on top of the internet. So if you see things like email, which you can often get through email through, without using a, a web interface, an email client, file transfer protocols, for those of you that may have a friend who's done file sharing in the past, you've probably used the internet without using the web. Um, particularly one of the things that made us really want to get away from the web as a sort of distinguishing feature of, of social media were applications. The more that we get social media through our phones, we often use the internet without using a web-based thing. And a lot of the definitions before us talked about, well, it's a web-based tool. And as soon as we read that, we went, well, now it doesn't work with Facebook because you can get through Facebook without going through an uh, internet browser. Second part of this, and here's our fun word, disentrained, right? Um, we are totally uh, appropriating this from Walther's uh, hyperpersonal model. Uh, really, sort of concisely, what disentrained means is the, the, when you're self-presenting yourself online or, or putting forth a message, you have some control over that message, over that self-presentation. You and the, the message are a little bit separated. So think about when you're typing a message out on, on Twitter, even on email. Um, if you don't like exactly what you've typed before you hit send, you can backspace. And that gives you some real opportunities for self-presentation, self for selective presentation. And social media tend to do this. Um, unlike Skype, where as soon as you say it, it's there, you can't unsay it, or face-to-face -face interaction, um, it, it allows you to have that ability to do some editing. Third thing, these channels are persistent, which means the channel exists even when you're not online. So sites like Yik Yak, where just because you're not online and yakking at the moment does not mean that Yik Yak is not occurring. There's not this conversation going online. And this extends beyond, uh, beyond some of the tools we typically think of, Facebook, Yik Yak, Twitter. Think of virtual worlds. Um, things like World of Warcraft, all of a sudden this fits this element of the definition because the world goes on even when you're not there. Even when you're online, Baron's chat still occurs. Fourth part of this is a term coined by O'Sullivan back in 99, mass personal. Um, and mass personal, um, this, is a, this is a topic that's not distinct to computer media communication, but CMC has really made this much more salient and timely and important. It's the idea of no longer are we constrained to this false dichotomy of there's interpersonal communication and mass communication. You and another person talking, or you talking to this sort of undifferentiated mass audience with limited channels for response. Through a lot of these, um, if we can forgive the term, new media, some of which are 20 years old, we see the ability to sort of conflate the two and do both. So we see uh, Daniel Moore being able to tweet the mayor of Calgary and say, hey, you know, what are you building this bridge for? And it's an interpersonal message. He is sending it specifically to one person. And the mayor replies back, I'm pretty sure the bridge is used to cross the river which if I ever moved to Calgary, this mayor is why, by the way. Um, and again, it's a specific response back to Daniel. And yet, we as the audience are seeing this. There's, it's just still this element of mass property to it. So it's this sort of the idea of standing on a box in, speaker, uh, standing on a box in speaker's corner and yelling aloud. It's, it's this sort of novel affordance that new media give us, or perceived affordance. Another element of this is the idea of perceived interaction. Um, and we actually were on an airplane flying back from a trip. We were trying to figure out, well, uh, social media is all about interaction. And we kept thinking, well, it's about thinking you're interacting. It's about the, it, the perception that you're interacting, especially because online we now have uh, it, opportunities for individuals to sort of, it looks like you're in a conversation, but they're not actually listening to each other. And even more importantly, for opportunities for uh, bots, agents, just online applications, scripts to respond to things. So we saw this great example of American Air had just set up a, a basically a script. So that anytime someone tweeted at them, they said, hey, thanks for the compliment. Even if the comment was basically American Airlines sucks, and their bot just tweets back, hey, thanks. This looks interactive. This feels interactive because you're getting a response. But there's, there's no dyadic, you know, respective to what we just said, your response does not change element of that communicative process. Lastly, and this is the one that I think can be the most, um, it was really important, it can be the most contentious to operationalize. The value of the site has to be derived from user-generated content. So we can, we can have something like New York Times that they put up a, a web content, but the value has to be not on the content provided by the sponsor, but rather by the interaction of the users in the site. That's what has to give me value. So think about Yelp. There's that great you know, rating system they have of this is four stars. 
But the value from that is, is seeing that that's user generated and then seeing the comments below. Yeah, this is great if you were there at this time, on this day, if this person is cooking for this meal. And being able to ask for clarification or get, even if you're not interacting, again, perceived interaction, having the ability to interact. So it's a little bit of subjective because what users on one site may view as, as the values user generated, other subsets may not. But I think it's a really important one. And all these come together to talk about what becomes social media. So knowing what they are, let's talk about the interaction. Let's go back to the communication on social media. We've seen for a long time that people can have relationships online. Parks and Floyd told us that, you know, when people start interacting, sorry, Parks and Floyd um, told us when you start interacting online, people can come together in these online communities and have meaningful relationships. They can establish friendships. So this whole idea that without all these cues online, they're not a meaningful communication, we've seen that sort of dissipate. Social media particularly gives us some, some unique opportunities for interactions, specifically by being lightweight. Now, lightweight inter interaction can take a couple forms. First of all, we can just be passive observers. And we see this oftentimes, we, we wake up in the morning, the first thing many of us do is we lean over, grab our phones, pick up our Facebook feed or whatever, and just scroll, scroll through what happened overnight. You know, we're just sort of checking in on what people are doing, that passive observation. I can keep up with my friends who went to different schools, different jobs, um, different time zones, keep up with what they're doing without actually having to sit down for coffee with them or <coughs> call them or send an email. One of the opportun opportunities is pretty short messages. Um, you know, you think if you sit down, for, if you go out for coffee with somebody, you sit down and say, how are you doing? And they say, fine, and you stand up and leave. It's an offered, co it's a, it's an offered coffee meetup. Online, those short interactions become much more meaningful to the point you can get as simple as, you know, just type one and it pre-populates, happy birthday, so-and-so. And last, and there's probably more to this, the last one we're going to focus on today, uh, one of the novel opportunities for interaction on social media are these one-click affordances. Depending on the medium that you're on, we'll see this change from the like to the favorite to the plus one to those of the Star Wars fans, BB-88's lighter up. Um, but the, you know, so the form they take will change. But we were looking through, we found out that the form changes, but the principle, these simple one-click activation cues are pretty stable across social media. And that's what's got us thinking, we really want to look at what these cues mean. So that's what got us into this series of studies, talking about, huh, we all use these particular affordances, these tools of social media. They're actually the most commonly used tool of social platforms, the likes, the upvotes, et cetera. But we were at ICA 2014 here, and I just realized that that was here, um, talking with a friend at a gelato place in downtown, that, and realizing that nobody had ever really explicated these features before, even though they were so commonly used. And no one, I should say no one, very little research had been done in terms of what they mean to people, how people use them, and how people, and this is really where we jumped off from, how people interpret them. What does it mean to people when they get that like? Is it just like, oh, you liked our content, or is it something else? And we wanted to dig into that. So we started on the liking studies and defined these simple tools as paralinguistic digital affordances, cues in social media that facilitate communication and interaction without specific language associated with their messages. And since they are one of the most common tools of social media, it seems kind of simple that they mean what they say they mean. It means like. It seems simple, but here's a hint, spoiler alert, it's not. Come on, there we go. We wanted to look at what they mean to both senders and receivers. And to do this, we engaged in first some qualitative research. We did two studies, um, a series of focus groups, and then some semi-structured interviews, talking to individuals about their use of social media and how they were interpreting the social media actions they were receiving from their friends across platforms. And what we found from this is really what I think, if we really think about our use of social platforms and these affordances, that it's more than just what we talk about as a fade at cue. Well, we don't talk about it, we didn't coin that term, but fade at cues in communication are just those 
that language that doesn't really have any specific meaning associated with it. It's a meaning that, or it's a cue that just helps you facilitate relationships. Like, hi, how you doing? Things that don't really mean anything to people. Or, you know, visual cues like, good job. But we found from these studies, unsurprisingly, that they're more than just that upvote. Yes, they can mean that, but it's more than that. We found that there is a lot of variance by both the site and the relationship the receiver has with the sender. So if it's the friend from high school that you barely talk to anymore and they like something that you post, or if they, in the old terminology of Twitter, favorite it, you kind of interpret it just as that. But if it's a closer friend, or if it's your mom, or if it's someone that you see all the time, it means something different, and I'll be talking about that in a minute. Some of these PDAs are coded, and we looked at this through structuration, adaptive structuration theory. Some of these PDAs are encoded and decoded by senders and receivers faithfully, as like the like, I enjoy the content that you posted. I endorse that content. And ironically, and this isn't irony in the Seinfeldian sense of irony, this isn't humor. This is ironically in the sense that the meaning is different than the intended meaning. It might be the opposite of the intended meaning. I think we've all seen that when we've had a friend or someone that we follow on a social platform have a negative experience and we see lots of PDAs associated with that negative experience. Well, are those votes or likes that they're receiving, hey, I like that your grandma died. No, of course they're not. It's probably a form of social support. I'm so sorry that your grandma died. But that's an ironic adoption of this seemingly very positive tool. We also found a lot of automatic usage of PDAs. A lot of people are just, and I know this is kind of gross, but <laughs> it's like automatic use of social media. A lot of people are just liking, favoriting, upvoting everything that they see from certain friends. Oh, Kelsey posted like. Oh, this new Snapchat from Brendan, favorite. That's what they're doing just sort of automatically. It's not really processing the content. And we saw a ton of that across all of our focus groups. The interesting thing is, though, so we looked at both sides of the dyad. We looked at both senders and receivers. And while senders know they are sending a lot of PDAs automatically, like, 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 favorite, 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 we don't decode them as such. We don't think of the likes and favorites that we're receiving as just being sent automatically. We're putting a lot more value on them, which makes absolutely no sense because we know we're sending them automatically, but we, then we take them very personally on receipt. We don't think about them being sent automatically. And that was one of my favorite findings of the focus groups. So what we can, what we could conclude from these, and this is a very short summary of what is a pretty big, um, pretty big paper, and if you'd like the whole thing, I can provide it to you, and it's in Jobum this month. But that PDAs provide a mean for contextualizing common behaviors, and findings indicate that we really should take care in both researching their role we can't really just assume that they mean this one thing. And we also need to mind the context for which they're provided. Likes, and this is something I'm going to talk about more in a minute, likes and favorites, so like, and I know they're called likes now on Twitter, but likes on Facebook and likes on Twitter don't necessarily mean the same thing to users. They're being interpreted differently. So the point of this was leading into, well, if they don't mean the same thing across the two platforms, can we really say, and I'm sure you've all seen this in some of the scholarly work that you've run on social media, when someone has done a study on one social platform and then in their limitations and future directions section are saying, well, we, can, we only looked at Facebook, but we can project that we might see the same effects on some other platforms. Can we really say that? And lots of people do. Rains and Bruner last year in a piece, oops, I'm not going to the right slide. There we go. Sorry. Rains and Bruner in a piece um, just this past year pointed out the same thing. 
kind of came to the same conclusion that we did. And when this came out, it was like, oh, yes, we really need to dig into this more. That two-thirds of studies looking into social media only do so on one platform. <laughs> Facebook. Two-thirds <laughs> frequently just use Facebook. And then many of those same studies at the end say things like, we can expect these effects to be similar in other platforms. And they argue very much that that is a dangerous projection to make. So what we did next was we wanted to examine whether social media platforms were truly comparable. This is a hard thing to do because we all know that social, different social media platforms provide different things to different people. Different platforms, we use them for different things. Snapchat is for one purpose, Facebook is for another. We, we know that inherently as social media users, but we needed a way to compare them. PDAs provided a really convenient way to do that because they're one of the very few tools that are similar across social media platforms. You know, we all have, a, on all platforms, we have ways to, to share pictures, but they're not the same and they're used for different, different purposes. But PDAs, are the, one of the very few things that seem to be, even though we found different contextualizations for them across the sites, one of the few things that are comparable. We also found from our qualitative research in the first set of studies that a lot of people's primary value of social media is, along with that interaction, is the social support that they receive from the people that they are friends with across the social platforms. Social support in the sense that I know where my people are and I know where to get help. I know who I can talk to when I'm having trouble or I know where to go if I need help moving. Something as simple as that, that's all social support. So we knew that they were supportive. We knew that um, PDAs were across all these platforms. We decided to engage in some future further research looking into how these PDAs provide social support. First, we wanted to document if there were differences across the different platforms in terms of effectiveness of social support. Then we also wanted to look at relational closeness. So relational, relational closeness in terms of how close I feel to this individual and this individual is then providing me with a PDA. That friend from high school versus your best friend versus your mom. We wanted to look, if there was, look at if there was differences in providing PDAs between the platforms there. And then finally, in the uh, second set of studies for this, um, what types of social support are provided and um, do the different tools and affordances of the particular sites affect that? So another multi-method study. First, we started with a um, national collection of social media users, so not perfectly generalizable to a nationwide audience, but pretty representative of social media users, and then focus groups to back that up because we knew we were going to have quantitative data that needed help with interpretation. Can't just always use stats, even though they're delightful. Um, some focus groups to help us interpret our data. What we found here was kind of interesting in that there were no differences across social media platform in terms of, sorry, bottom half, bottom triangle. No differences in terms of relational closeness between the platforms. And this is something I personally was surprised at, and that's kind of the most fun research you can do, is when you think you're going to find one thing and you're wrong. I actually kind of like that. Um, no differences in relational closeness. And I'm going to get to, we figured out, we think, why in a minute. But it actually comes down to who the relationship is with. Is it friends versus family? So no differences across the platforms, but we did see differences in social support, providence of social support across the platforms, different times and in significantly different amounts. <laughs> so Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter are providing it differently. Um, and then LinkedIn, which we're not going to be talking about all that much, also provided social support, which is kind of interesting. When we think LinkedIn, we just use it professionally actually was helping provide social support, but in a way different than Facebook. These results we turned into a focus group protocol. We wanted to find out why those differences existed, and then me with my own curiosity of there were no relational differences between the platforms. What, what, what? I always expected there to be. What was going on? So we used these results to construct focus group protocols, and we found in the focus groups that the audience 
on the different social platforms. And as soon as I say this, you're going to be like, oh, yep, that's, that's what's going on. The audiences might be equally close across the platforms, but the relationships are different. So Facebook, you know on Facebook now your mom's there, your grandma's there, your aunt's there, and you've got to be really careful about what you post because then your mom's going to see it. Well, you're equally close with your mom as you might be with your best friend. So the way we had measured closeness before was that scale that looks at the concentric circles and inclusion of the, I'm sorry, I blanked on the name, the inclusion of other scale, which looks at how close you feel you are to the person you are interacting with. So in our data collection, it, we had them look at their last three PDAs and then identify how close they were to the person that provided the PDA. So a PDA from your mom and a PDA from your best friend on the inclusion of other scale would have been the same. Whereas we know that our family is on Facebook, but not so much on Snapchat, not so much on Instagram. So we're equally close to our audiences if we use that scale, but the relationships are very different. So we found different amounts of social support and different types of social support between the different platforms, somewhat because there are different audiences available on those different platforms. This I'm going to go through pretty quickly just so we can get to the next study. But the dimensions of social support, Katrona and Soar's um, dimensions of social support, we found that emotional support lived primarily on Facebook. This is where you go when you're having a bad day and you just need a hug. And actually our third author on this piece is examining now what happens when we rename it hug. So Katie had asked about um, what, um, where is this going in terms of reactions. Well, one of our co-authors on this, or our other co-author on this, is looking at if there's a hug available, what to do in terms of social support. Informational support. So I just need to know someone. Hey, I'm in Seattle, and I want to know good places to eat. Facebook for that as well. Not so much Twitter, Instagram, um, that type of, those other platforms. Instrumental support was interesting, talking to the folks groups about that. Instrumental support is when you need material help or, like, money. You need to borrow money from someone, or non-material support, I need help moving. Focus groups are really funny in the sense that they were saying, oh my gosh, we could never put that out publicly on Facebook or Twitter, because what if nobody responds? That's embarrassing. If you ask for help and nobody offers, it's too embarrassing to have that in a mass personal context, a very public context. So they would never use it for that type of support. Appraisal support, like, that's um, looking at evaluations of yourself. How's this outfit today? That was a Snapchat thing, and it's specifically because of the audience available. So that's where all your close friends were that you could trust for advice for something as you know, not important, sort of silly as how's the outfit to what should I do about this significant relational problem. Snapchat as a very targeted network was valuable to that. And as hard as I could try, because so I was a moderator for this, couldn't get them to talk about network support. They just didn't seem to use um, social media for network support. But again, highly condensed version of a very big paper. I can provide it if anybody would be interested in getting into the details of that. So out of all this, uh, the third the third study we're going to talk about today dealt with then try to dig more into this nature of social support. So if these PDAs are being referred to as supportive pretty unilaterally across a series of uh, three focus groups and a group of interviews, one of the questions we want to understand is how is support actually being derived or being perceived? Because ultimately what you're getting is one Q. And yet people are sort of responding that they're getting these wide variations, these huge swings in how supportive they perceive it is off of sometimes the very same cue. So we're really interested in trying to tackle this. Specifically, in, in a lot of the, most of the things we were looking at here, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Snapchat, all, also fit the definition not only of social media, but slightly more narrowly as social network sites. And we realized that in social network sites, there's probably a couple things that can guide how individuals look for and then receive and interpret social support. First of all, social network sites tend to span relational audiences, relational contexts. So as a result, how close a specific individual is. Becky mentioned earlier that you know, the, the, the um, previous results showed us that quantitatively there were no differences in sort of the aggregate relational closeness between sites. 
but certainly we know that there's individual differences. When each individual person provides you a PDA, there's differences in, in relational closeness there. And we've known for a long time, Granometer told us this, we've seen good, good validation of the data sense, that people that are closer to you should give you greater social support, likely even if they're giving the same cue. Additionally, social network sites allow us to facilitate, trying to, try to achieve multiple goals. So you can go on there to try to get information or try to get social support. So we predicted that if you are seeking social support with a certain post, you are more likely to interpret a PDA as socially supportive. So your goal will affect how you interpret the feedback received. And finally, that lightweight interaction we were talking about earlier. So the perceived automaticity. If you think that someone is just giving you a like as a, as a means of reciprocity, they, that you like something they posted earlier, so they're just liking you back, not because they actually read the content, or if they're just one of those people that goes down and likes, likes, likes everything, that's going to be less meaningful to you, and as a result, provide less social support. So we went back into the data set Becky mentioned earlier. We again had 325 participants, and we each asked each of these people, give us the three people that most recently liked PDA, it was adapted for the individual site, um, whatever your last post was. So ultimately this gave us 975 dyads, and that became sort of the corpus of data for this to analyze. In, in the paper, it's uh, coming out at ICA, it's currently under, uh, under its last, hopefully last round of revisions for a journal. Um, we've got this data broken down into three different things, a table, a regression set, and a correlation matrix. Um, what I'm going to do here is present the univariate, re uh, univariate regressions for all these, which is not the most precise way to look at exactly each one of these hypotheses, but it becomes the most parsimonious, and I only have to burn one slide. So, our first hypothesis, um, what we looked at was that social support sought. If you were looking for social support, if you posted something like, I'm having a crummy day, and you got likes, plus ones, upvotes from it, controlling for the participant, you are much more likely to perceive that individual PDA as socially supportive. Second hypothesis said the relational closeness. This is again the Granovetter hypothesis. The closer you are to a person, the more you perceive their PDA as supportive, regardless of what the content of the post was. And sure enough, this was supported as well. Third hypothesis looked at that autom automaticity. We said the more automatic you think that the post is, the less, or the less supportive you think it is. If you think they just clicked it because they were going through on a run, less support. But we knew that that was going to be uh, correlated with how close you were to someone. You have to know, uh, you tend to, the more you know someone, the more you sort of get a feeling if this is automatic or not. So we see here a negative, negative relationship. The more automatic, the less supportive, but even controlling for that, still your relational closeness matters and with a nice interaction effect. The last step of this, we put all these things into a pot, full interaction model, and everything gets supported. So there's a lot of complex dynamics going on here. Let me take one second though and break some of these down. So we say main effects for all three. In sort of the ways that we would commonly, commonly expect, um, one of my favorites to pull out here is, is the relational closeness matters. So if we simply bifurcate at the midpoint, uh, so at the midpoint of the data, um, the relation, and say, well, those above the midpoint are relationally close, those below are relationally distant. Not the best way to do it, but it helps the visualization. We see huge differences in how supportive from the same queue, even in the same site, a PDA becomes. Even more interesting, though, and more now to these findings, are these interaction effects. And there's a couple that I want to pull out here. First one I want to, the, the big one I want to pull out is what we call in the, in the um, manuscript is the Daphnis effect. Daphnis was a uh, Greek poet known for um, his speaking abilities. Because Daphnis is so wordy, this seems pretty appropriate, because Daphnis sometimes spoke words even when they weren't necessary. So we see this interaction effect between your relational closeness and the perceived automaticity of a like. I know it looks like these lines are parallel, they are converging, there are different slopes here. The relationally close is this top green line. So as you are more relationally close to someone, the more meaningful and socially supportive you perceive that PDA to be. Unless you know that person is just sort of willy-nilly giving out likes, at which point there's a decreasing return. Now for the, the uh, article, we call this the Daphnis effect. I think as Particularly some folks may know the, the term we use for the ICA paper may be even more illustrative than this. We called it the Bowman effect. If you've ever met Nick Bowman, a scholar out of West Virginia, Nick likes everything. Which when Nick likes something of yours is nice, but it's not very meaningful. And that's really the effect that we're seeing here. Ultimately what this comes down to is how do we interpret these PDAs, at least for social support, 
It's, an, it's a really interesting process of interpersonal and intrapersonal effects. You interpret the PDA based both on who is giving it to you. You know, what do I know about this person? How automatic is it? How close am I to them? But then it's also intrapersonal. What was I seeking from the post that, that had to be made to have the PDA provided to it? And there's some sort of self-fulfilling prophecy and, and um, confirmation bias that's probably going on there. Ultimately, out of this, I think this probably suggests to us there's probably some heuristic processing going on because you know, we have hundreds and sometimes thousands of likes and favorites going on. And we you know, both make sense of them in the aggregate. You know, it means something to us when we have 100 likes to our post or 10 likes to our post. But we also, when we look through that list, we look for, well, who's on there and who's not? And very quickly, idiosyncratically make judgments about each and every one of those PDAs, at least when they're presented to us. Out of this, I think there's some general takeaways we can have. And obviously, we didn't survey every, every social medium and social network out there. Um, but ultimately, these things are pretty amorphous cues for being pretty stable. It used to be when the files gave you a, gave you a thumbs up, or rain, or even Emma Stone. These all kind of meant the same thing. Good job. I like that. What these studies show us is, is, is in fact, a little more complicated than that. The same gesture from a different person in different circumstances. We know something different about them. You know, face to face, when one person's happy and the other person's panicked, it's pretty easy to see. Online, we can't see their face when they click that like button. It can be more challenging, but it still gets done. And I think that becomes really interesting how much we read into a PDA for what's the same cue can differentiate between people and situations. Ultimately, this meaning gets derived then from the sender, who actually sends the PDA, the receiver, who gets it, and the channel in which it's made. Because even if it's called you know, a like in one channel, a like in the other, there's still some, some ver uh, variance in how that gets interpreted. There's still a lot more done, to be done here. One of the questions we talked about earlier is what happens to the re these reactions? What happens if I like it versus cry it versus hate it versus love it? You know, there's still some more, more, more questions to be asked, although these interestingly may not be PDAs because it takes sometimes a hover and a click, which may be different. But there's still a lot of ground to be covered. With that, though, let's, I think, turn it over to you guys. And what questions do you have? Sure. Um, so our colleague about Wong is at you know, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Worked with Bob LaRose a lot. Um, Bob LaRose is one of his big areas of habits. So there's a auto, there's a established scale for habitual use that we just modified. And, um, and if, if you give me a couple minutes, I can pull up the actual scale for you. Um, but it's essentially this person used it without thinking. This person uses it um, frequently without purpose. This person does it just because they can. So it's uh, it's, it's part of the um, self-perceived habit index. Of the other. Of the other. Of the so other I, I think. Is interesting. Yes. Why, Why is it interesting to you, though? Well, I don't want to cut my car. No, no, I'm just, I, I, I was just curious. I'm going to think a little bit. I mean, okay. yeah. So I have a whole series, as you expect, I have a whole series of questions about the system. And one simple question is why not tell me? Oh, the Why Not Tumblr was um, the original sample that we were using. You know, it, it, there seems to be idiosyncratic adoption of social platforms across social groups. The original group that we did focus groups and interviews for in Liking One, a piece that's out this month, no, nobody used it. Got it. Okay. And it really simple. And then in the um, actual collection, the quantitative collection that we did, it was an option and very, very few people selected it. So somehow we just didn't have very much use of it, so it didn't end up in the sample. Got it. Okay. So, but that leads me to something that you said, um, which is, so, so you, you think, um, you said that the, one of the things that different platforms have is they all have PDAs. And they're all structured fairly similarly, although you tease out the differences. Why, why do you think that is? Why do you think they look? Why do you think the buttons look the same going across? Well, you could take one or two perspectives here. You could say that pop, copying the popular and that Facebook, you know, as the not first social platform, but the first humongous social platform, it had it and got it in 2009 
And then Twitter added that feature within a month of that, copying the popular tool of another site. You could say that. You could also say that it's there because users expect it and need some way to acknowledge. And we found, I didn't talk about it, a lot of use of the PDAs simply as an acknowledgement. We said that that was an ironic adoption, you know, not the humorous version, but the not intended use. I've just seen this. And that there is a need on social media to be able to acknowledge that without commenting, and that seems to be it. So why do they exist across all social platforms? Well, probably it's a combination of copying Facebook and the actual um, creators of the site realize that there's a need for people to be able to acknowledge that their con that user content has been seen. This the, that's, it's an interesting question because it dovetails really well into the arguments Naomi Barron was making a decade ago about the linguistic importance of, of email, right? Mm -hmm. That that so I, so you gave you gave kind of uh, technology designers do it and did it this way and so then we all learned. Mm -hmm. But you know Barron's work would say actually we've been pretty fluent in this language before Facebook was ever a thing, right? When it was just a glimmer in, in Mark Zuckerberg's eye, mm -hmm. we, were, we were doing something that was closer to your um, PDA in email, according to Darren. So I would be careful of kind of putting too much agency with the technology companies there, although they are tracking very closely. And then it also made me think to what extent the notion of algorithmic parsing becomes really key. So you've got very different algorithmic affordances happening across these different platforms. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you know the work that has shown that only 64% of Facebook users are aware that the new seats are algorithmically. So you know this is coming out of um, Sandvig and Carl Haas out of Kai and CSCW from the last two years. But their big studies really shown that you've got um, you know, uh, people are receiving the wrong message from the algorithm, right? So they're not getting likes because somebody actually literally does not see the message in their mm -hmm. newsfeed. So I, so I would, I would think you would want to consider that as you design the next study or or build on that kind of thing. There is this tension in the affordance, both of the ways in which people understand it and misunderstand mm -hmm. it. Sure. And the ways in which they're 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 reevaluating their relationships in that way. And the, the thing about this data, and, and you're absolutely right, right. And, and sort of where we were coming from here, and the, the first step was we're assuming they've seen it. We're assuming they've interacted with it. There's the, you know, the and actually I think it's about three studies in going, well, you know, how does this fit with the design features and the user features? Um, yeah, I mean this is a this is this is a rabbit hole to go down. I mean the the work that Christian Sandvik and his collaborators are doing is I mean it's showing just from algorithm audits. It's showing vast, vast gaps in what is actually posted by the network and what people actually see through their Facebook um, algorithmically um, and one of the things, I don't know if you noticed um, the trending uh, hashtag the past couple of days, RFP Instagram, that Instagram's the last platform that has a chronologically um, presented newsfeed, one that wasn't driven by an algorithm and that's going to change next month. And this, what, this is the last great chance to grab good data where it is chronological versus presented by the algorithm. And I hope someone's doing that because I'm not. Um, but uh, the, that concern right there that when it's chronologically presented, I think we can assume that a bigger diversity of content is presented and you have more opportunities for your content to be interacted with. And when it is presented by an algorithm, it seems to be the stuff that gets more likes, more PDAs is up at the top. So we're gonna see more, and this is the other stuff in my research, but more branded content because there's more people to like that content. It's gonna change the makeup and change what people are exposed to and what they're able to react to. You get a small world effects. Yes. Mac, we got to go back one second. Did that cover your automaticity concerns? Well, I just wanted to think about it because it's an interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, that, uh, so the value of, say, a self-disclosure is, is sometimes uh, determined a little bit by your perception of whether the discloser discloses it indiscriminately. So um, that's essentially what's going on with this um, 
sort of an interesting process going on here. Maybe, maybe it is simply a habit. Mm -hmm. And so I assume that the person who likes a lot of stuff is uh, just habitually doing that, uh, which is an interesting behavior in and of itself to try to explain. Uh, on the other hand, it could be that uh, the information value is uh, just reduced because of a more complex calculation uh, that, that people do. And it'd be interesting to know how people respond to, it'd be interesting to dig into that perception of what the user, the, the liker, is actually doing. Yeah, the, the so last... Sounds like you had a real general scale. That, yeah, and the last study we did, and kind of back to the earlier point, you know, this is all receiver-oriented. I'm getting a, like, how do I interpret this? Mm -hmm. I think the person giving this is doing it automatically, but we don't know, you know, this is... And from a receiver perspective, maybe it doesn't matter as much. Um, we have some data in the liking piece. That, I think it's in liking one. The, the, for, for why do we send likes? Yes. So in, in the liking piece that just came out in Job, we've got some of the sender data. When you send a like, and it taps into some of some of the questions that you guys are dealing into. We've not had a chance to do that quantitatively yet, though, or, or build on that more. So we know it's there. We know it's happening, and, and it's in some great ways to drive. But we've got we've got lots of question marks yet. It goes back. It goes back to your question. I mean, does it matter to the sender? It does. Well, it's revealing about the process. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I'd be interested in, in what happens when you look down, say, on Facebook, um, and and you you've posted something, but there on your feed are a bunch of posts from other people, and then uh, and and then you could actually manipulate the likes and who they came from. And if you look down that page and you see that uh, Bob is like everything that's been posted there, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, that's maybe a little different response when Bob likes your post. It'd be interesting to know what people, how people calculate that, what their thresholds are, and if senders are uh, actually tactical about it. Mm -hmm. I, I think, and adding on that, that there's another part of it in thinking. So, for example, my mom has like 20 Facebook friends. I have thousands. So, to be honest, a like for me is kind of a gift. Okay? <laughs> because I'm seeing so much content that if you got a like from me, like compared to my mom who has 20 friends, the effort involved in her liking those is very small. Whereas I'm seeing a ton. I. I don't know, I think you guys might categorize me as a likey, heavy uh, liker. Tom, Tom and all would call you a Facebook whore. <laughs> <laughs> you have more than a thousand friends. Yeah, but that's but Steph, not us. But, you know, <laughs> and you, might, you guys might perceive me as liking a lot, but you guys don't know on my side how much more stuff I'm seeing. Just because you guys see me liking stuff from you guys and our mutual friends, you don't know that, that that's a small slice of my Facebook world and actually, I'm very, very picky. So I think that like the, 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 that uh, proportion is automated, right? Like what is behind? And that's why I was thinking the same thing. Like how is automation operationalized? And is this really an automation thing? Or is this like liking wars? Like some, my mom likes a lot of stuff. She doesn't really know how to use Facebook. And she's only got 20 friends. It's a gendered grooming, right? Yeah. Grooming, is, it, is it the gender grooming? And I think that there is. Strategic. I, I absolutely think that liking is strategic. Mm -hmm. I, I know I strategically like things today, even. I mean, mm -hmm. I just do that. So, and, and and then if you look at like Twitter, if I favorite or heart or whatever it is now, I actually do that just to save links I want to look at later. It's not necessarily that I liked it. It's just I want that to was look at it later. That was one of the bigger findings in the original focus groups, and I didn't quite realize how pervasive it was as the the Twitter PDA as a file system, essentially, to be able to save content for later and then also strategically for those individuals that we were talking to who were using it professionally. They wanted to be interacting with certain professionals in their chosen industry more, so they would favorite the content of those professionals just because they knew that those people would, at least for a brief second, see their name. And that was strategic, I think, partly how you're using it. But uh, it was a file system, the ironic option of a file system. And yeah, I think this is a very, very complicated thing, and I'm glad you guys are starting mm -hmm. in on looking at it. But it's really tough. It's 
really, um, it's really a difficult thing to figure out because there's just, it's, like, it was amazing to me that your uh, H4 extended model, I mean, it just shows how complex oh, yeah. this seemingly simple action is. Well, well what it doesn't, doesn't show, so, so to be very personal for a moment, welcome to my world. Brace yourselves, it's going to get weird. Um, so when I got married and put that on Facebook, you know, changed my relational status, I got like 150 likes. Cool. When I had a kid and you know, posted that announcement, like 200 likes. Still to this day, the favorite singular like that I ever got was from one person. It's when Joss Whedon liked something that I posted. And you know what? The whole world can burn until the director of Buffy and writer of Toy Story and Speed likes what I wrote. And all of a sudden, like, like we, let's not make any mistakes here. Joss Whedon and I are not friends. I mean, we are on my head, but like, you know, we're like relational close and scale. We are, you know, bottom basement effect out. But when the right person acknowledges that I existed, all of a sudden, like, my self efficacy went up. Like, it was amazing. So even there, you know, that doesn't even fall on the scale of relational closeness, but also is it the person you were targeting? You know, there's, there's more dimensions here to be picked at. And I think these were some of the things we could do theoretically and um, send their side. Can I, can I skip you for a second? Because we've got one of your colleagues in the back. You've been waiting so patiently. Uh, um, I just, I'm kind of confused because you ended that with the new reactions on Facebook. Maybe they're not considered like the PDAs anymore because it's a click and a hover. Mm -hmm. But I feel like people are still expressing like their reactions and wouldn't that click and a hover actually help in discerning who are clicking automatically just the like button and who are taking the time to hover and like love it or being angry at it or like that kind of stuff. So I'm just confused on why you wouldn't mm -hmm. consider those PDAs anymore. It's actually a two part question. Like, like why we wouldn't, wouldn't consider PDAs, PDAs and what you said secondarily they're actually would fix the automaticity problem. Um, so that was brilliant, what you said, the second part. And the first part's a good question, so both brilliant. The first part, why it wouldn't be strictly a PDA, is because there, and it's loose here. So we would say probably because there's an extended thought process as you hover, look at the things, and decide which you're feeling right then, like, okay, oh, yep, it's this and then react in that way versus the one just thing that can mean multiple things, which we could have a really long debate about and probably both sides would be right. Um, so there's that. The second part, the, that the reactions would remove the automaticity part of it, you are very correct in that the perception of automaticity, which we didn't see all that much of. So that's what I was saying where folks were both doing it automatically but then not perceiving it as automatically. If we did see in, in the um, second quantitative collection, we were using that habit index. If folks would have the same perception that it was automatic with a reaction, I'm going to guess that you're right that it would go down, that people wouldn't interpret these automatically because we know it requires that extra teeny tiny but still extra step of effort. Mm -hmm. You're probably right there. Um, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Great point. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of just have like a clarifying question. On Twitter, I know retweets are also one click keys. Were those considered the same as likes? No. No, for the same reason um, we just talked about when you're retweeting something. Like, yes, it's before the quote thing, like now it just automatically, like, do you want to add something to this? But before, yes, it's just one click, but then you're sharing that information with your network for a purpose. So you're taking one you know, unit of information and sharing it with a new network. This, that like is just going to the original number of the original person that sent it. Well, and, so that, and that retweet also doesn't, is typically not paralinguistic because you're one click, but then there's 140 there's characters or something. It's, there's a message there that you're sort of endorsing. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's similar, similar sort of user interface, different um, communicative cue being sent. Yeah. So another one click tool, just a lot more detailed. Matt, can we come back part? to your question? Yeah, well, I'm just thinking about your, your answer. I, I guess, yeah, you are endorsing a, a message when you retweet. Mm -hmm. And you could add something. Mm -hmm. That's true. But you're also endorsing a message when you use a like. And that is you're, you're endorsing the original material that was posted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess I... I, I, I trying to be disagreeable, I, I guess I just, I, I see some overlap 
in, in those functions. And that, that I can see why whoever it was who, who said that, uh, said that, that kind of makes sense to me. Endorsing also might be the wrong word for. Uh, that might have been just my. Yeah, um, well, you're referring to Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, it's like if you came to me and, and, and said, um, you know, I'm thinking about working on this research project, and I did this, versus OK. Um, you know, one, one has sort of, you have to imply some meaning from this versus the OK, which still has multiple meanings that may be inferred. You know, if, you say, if I say, OK, or OK, there's, there's meaning there. But it's sort of how much of that paralinguistic fat acuity you have to read into. And I, and I think, but it's an empirical question. Undergrad or grad student? Undergrad. When you go on to grad school, you have a thesis topic. Run with it. <laughs> Cite liberally. Um, you know, but it's, it's also it's an empirical question of, well, well, is this the same thing? Does it mean the same meaning? Um, and, and it didn't fit within the sort of the, the conceptual thing that we'd come up with in, in the recent paper. But I'm willing to be proven wrong. Yeah. I'll see your like by Josh Moon, and I'll raise it a retweet from Neil Gaiman. Me. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> he's my favorite. Like, best awesome. day of my life. Oh, my he's gosh. Like, he's like a little god. See? <laughs> and it was a retweet. That's really? amazing. He okay. was endorsing your idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he didn't just The like second it. one that is Cory Doctorow. And then the third one is my shirt. So that's like my trinity of like retweets, OK? Wow. I think we read a lot into those. They like mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. they, want to be they, really they really like, really like me. me. Uh, so Someone tweet about that and get Sally Fields to really like you, it'll be so meta. <laughs> but then we can also go into that and not take away from you just said at all. We're retweeting Donald Trump a lot these days because of the asinine things he's saying, but usually providing commentary. True, which is why I think your methodology is really well suited to teasing out these perceived affordances. Right, that it it really is in not not to any horns, but it really is in this nexus of what was intended by the button mm -hmm. or the the feature, what people think they're doing, um, and then what they perceive or misperceive. Right? I mean, there's these, there's these you know, there's, it's the, it's it's the material features, it's the design intent. And it's what they're doing is is important, right? So there's something there that people think they're doing something very different when they retweet Donald Trump than when you know Joss Whedon sure. retweets us. Well, back, back to your thesis project, project when you know when I retweet Donald Trump or Kim Kardashian or whatever banal tweeter there is, um, and and someone else does it. We may be doing it for very different reasons. You know, your this other person's retweet may very, be very faithful according to adaptive structuration. I mean, maybe very, very ironic, ironic, you know. So, so, the, so the same, same sort of tensions run here. Um, there's a lot of play, linguistics, non-linguistics. Um, it's something we kind of came up with, like, given sitting around this gelato shop, going, "So we should look at this," and um, thought it'd be sort of this quick little like one shot, like, "Oh, there's things happening here." And you know, five studies later, we're still going, and it's 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 been interesting. So, with, with your appreciation of the like. Um, from uh, celebrity commentator A, B, or C um, that's been mentioned, uh, be reduced if you discover that commentator in question was, in fact, an internet whore. Uh, liked everything. <laughs> yeah, to who liked everything. Personally, no. Personally, no. And furthermore, I would argue that uh, you might not even perceive it because the status effect would cause you to misperceive their behavior yes. and attribute more distinctiveness to it than it may actually have. I think it's like when you go to a, a, any you know, signed copy, autographed, whatever. If you go to the bookstore and, and uh, Neil signs the book for you, and like, you know, to Gene, all my best, best forever, best friends, Neil. Like, you know, you cognitively know that we are not like besties now forever. But you know the, the, the value you place on it and sort of the, the signal that puts that on your bookshelf um, has, has, has something different to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I definitely liked this presentation. So let's thank you.